It gets weirder, don't worry. So I was on book tour and I was in St. Louis, and I did an interview with someone from a local alternative newspaper. And just a short Q&A, and she was writing up about how Jerry O'Connell plays a big part of this. You know, he's like sort of the celebrity I got to meet and how you know, crazy this whole story is. And she's like, I'll send you an email um, when the story's up and running. Two days later, I'm in Milwaukee, and uh, she sends me the story. And I have to say to her, oh, I've already seen this. Jerry O'Connell sent it to me. <laughs> Which means one of two things. He either has a Google alert set for Jerry O'Connell, <laughs> or a Google alert set for Christian Lander. <laughs> either way, it was pretty awesome. So that, was sort of, that sort of brings me up to, uh, you know, to the end of 2008. And then the next stage that happened was the book has been optioned by a production company to be turned into a TV show, hopefully. It's in stage one right now. And get going, getting a TV show is very, very difficult. But stage one has started. And my fingers are crossed. And it will be awesome if it actually happens. So that's, in a nutshell, the last year of my life of what it's been like. It's been absolutely incredible. I am a very average person who got very, very, very lucky. But it shows what happens when you have a great idea with, pat myself on the back a little bit, great execution. The two things together, it's amazing what can happen because it just spreads so quickly. So this is the part where I want to sort of sound halfway intelligent about what I'm writing about. So, so the book, right? Stuff white people like. A lot of people end up asking me about the title. Um, either calling me racist or asking me, like, what do you mean this doesn't include all white people? Because I get a lot of hate mail from people who write in, and they say things like, you know what, man, I don't like, I don't like sushi, you know? <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like outdoor performance fleece, man. This is, this is racist. Um, and I always like to say, I'm like, so if someone makes generalizations about your race that don't apply to you, you're offended? I think there's a few people you might want to talk to who can relate to this problem. So I, I get that a fair bit. But anyway, so where the title comes from. So white people. Now, I grew up in the middle of the city in Toronto, not a suburban kid, uh, as witnessed by me not driving a car because I didn't get my license until I was 26. And I grew up during Toronto's change. So when I was a child, my neighborhood was still working class. There was actually a factory near my house. And as I grew up, all the working class white people moved out of the city. They were all priced out of the city. So literally, the only white people I knew growing up were the kind that I write about in the book. So when Miles and I talked about white people, these were the only white people around. I didn't meet my first conservative until I moved to the U.S. when I was 22 years old. And even then, it was like, seriously? <laughs> You're 22. How are you so angry? Um, but but what, what that meant is it had created this really homogenous type of white people. Everyone was left wing. Everyone was upper middle class. Everyone had an arts degree. Uh, and these were the type of white people. And the other thing that was interesting was, in Toronto, my high school was, it's called Jarvis Collegiate. It's right, right downtown, and it's one of the most multicultural high schools in Canada. Uh, about 40% of the school are ESL students, English as a second language students. And that makes for an interesting high school. So I played two years of American football as a starter at my school <laughs> on offensive line. For those of you unfamiliar with American football, uh, the average NFL offensive lineman is six foot six, 300 pounds. The average American high school one's like 6'1", 230 pounds. I'm not anywhere near there. But when your school's made up predominantly of Chinese and Sri Lankan immigrants, I was one of the larger guys at the school. <laughs> but it was really interesting. So the, the student body was made up of people who were very new to Canada, people who were second generation, third generation. And what happened was, if you weren't white, and you liked anything that I talk about in this book, you were accused of acting white. So the example I like to use is I, I wrote a post about white people in shorts, but how white people break out shorts way too early in hopes that they can will spring sooner. <laughs> that post was actually inspired by a Chinese guy named Long who was really into hacky sack and camping and the tragically hip. And every single day he got called a banana. Every single day by the other Asian students. You know, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. And so, same thing with the Indian guys who are super into uh, rugby. It's, it's a, well, you guys know. Um, and it was, and, and that was the case. And so, 
white was not only necessarily white skin tone wise, it was fundamentally a class thing. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. You don't have to be white to be white. You just have to be rich. <laughs> you can think about that one for a second. Um, but that summed it up because what it, what, it was, what it was really talking about was all of these things fundamentally involve white privilege. And I'll tell you, nothing pisses white people off more than when you accuse them of having white privilege. <laughs> it drives them insane. They're like, you know what? You know what? Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you. I worked hard for that English degree. I worked hard for that unpaid internship. I've earned this assistant job, you know? And it's like, you're missing the point that, you know what? English degree, privilege. Seriously. I mean, look, I have one, right? So I, I can attest to this. I, I mean, I almost have three. Uh, but you point out that to be able to get an English degree says, you know what? Fuck money. I don't need it, right? I'd ra I, want to, I want something more, you know, I want to be fulfilled through arts and, you know, being recognized as a genius, whatever. Um, same thing with unpaid internships. You have to be rich to take, like, people will crawl over themselves to take unpaid internships in New York City for the summer. Do you know how expensive that is? To give away work for free? All of that's privilege. And when you talk about it, it drives them nuts because they have worked for something, but they hate to recognize that there's privilege tied into it. And there's privilege tied into pretty much everything I talk about in here. And it's not necessarily always because you're white, but it's because of the money you've acquired and sort of the, your class and where, where you've moved to. So the other part that came out of this was when I went to graduate school, uh, my PhD program, I was doing film and literature. And I like to call that useful and more useful. <laughs> Microsoft was like knocking on my door every day. They're like, please work for us. We need somebody to criticize stuff. <laughs> um, and I was like, no, man, I got to finish my degree. Um, <laughs> but what I noticed was all of my fellow grad students, all of my amazingly unique fellow grad students were all exactly the same, exactly the same. They weren't mainstream, but they all liked the same movies. They all voted the same way. They all read the same books. I had to fight with them at the vintage store for the right t-shirts. You know what I mean? Like, it was a battle, and it was a full-on competition because when everyone's the same, you gotta fight to differentiate. You know what I mean? I had to be into a band like three weeks before all of my friends, or else I'd look like an idiot. And so I was just sort of noticing this ridiculous competition that kept going on. And I mean, I won, right? Like, let's make that clear. Of all those guys, like, I totally won. But they were all exactly the same. And I think I felt so much anger towards that. I mean, I left graduate school with a fairly bitter taste in my mouth. But I felt so, I was so happy to write about this stuff. I felt so angry that they all acted like they were so unique, but they were all exactly the same. So that's where the title comes from, you know, The Definitive Guide to the Unique Taste of Millions. And, um, and so it was really fun to sort of point out everything they like in a site. And it's great because, so I used to work in advertising. And in advertising, one of the things you do is you create user profiles where you essentially think about who your target customer is going to be and you just sort of write out who they are. And the people I'm writing about hate the idea that that can be done to them. And so that was one of my favorite things about the site. Some people would look at it and they would expect stuff white people like is going to be golf and dancing like this and lawn mowing. <laughs> and like all these played out stereotypes that are completely depleted, but then they look at it and they're like, oh no, 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 no. Damn it! <laughs> Shit, this guy got me. And so, it was so much fun for me to do that. So, but it was also fun to really stick it to some of these former grad students. And I have one story from my grad student experience I will never ever forget. During my orientation week, we were learning how to use the computer system in Indiana. And an undergraduate was telling us how the computers work saying, well, all the computers work. We have a master drive and a slave drive. Make sure you save everything to the slave drive because the master drive's cleared every two weeks. No big deal, right? Like, it's called slave drive because it's connected to the master drive, which goes to the motherboard. Well, it was a big deal for someone in my class, a white guy, who just starts going, you can't, you can't say that. You can't, you, can't, you cannot, you cannot say that. And so this undergrad's like, any questions? And he's like, too flustered to even raise his hand. He's like, <laughs> So she gets up to leave, and he chases her down in the hallway and starts berating her, going, you cannot use that kind of language in a classroom. That is racist language. You cannot. Not in this day and age. Uh, and he keeps going crazy. And then, only in academia, we had to go to a one 
hour seminar to talk about what happened. I can't get this hour back. I'd use it for anything else. And at the end of the seminar, we agreed that we would write a letter to Microsoft to tell them to change the language they use for their drives. Not Apple, right? Uh, and it was just, it was the most pointless experience I'd ever had. And so I had a post uh, on the site that white people like being offended. And it comes from this guy, getting offended on behalf of everyone and no one at the same time. And we literally got together and decided to write a letter to Microsoft to tell them to change this language. And on that day, we fixed racism. <laughs> That's why Obama got elected. Seriously. <laughs> everyone saw that letter and they were like, you know what? It's time for a change. <laughs> um, and so I was so fed up with that. And it just, it, it drove me nuts. And that's pretty much the idea I have behind some of this. Most of it was, again, like I was saying, going after competition and really just sort of nailing how exactly the same we all are. Because white people are everywhere. I mean, I'm living proof that I'm down here, right? But white people are everywhere. They're teaching English in Japan, you know, and they're in Europe studying abroad, and they're living here, and they're living in Canada, and yeah. So it's been really amazing to see the more people that see the site and say, oh my God, this is so me, it's kind of humiliating for me because I was putting myself out there and realizing how many people are exactly like me, like 60 million at last count, <laughs> really doesn't bode well for my, my uniqueness. So I picked, a few, uh, I picked a few things to read here that I felt uh, were applicable to Sydney. Now, first thing, I really don't understand why they had this reading in this neighborhood at all. It doesn't seem to apply to this book. Uh, I, I just couldn't get it. I mean, I, I was walking past this vintage clothing store and then a children's clothing store and then like nine coffee shops and like 15 Thai restaurants, and a bike shop. And I was like, why am I here? This doesn't fit with me at all. Uh, and for the record, if I was in Sydney, I would totally live in this neighborhood. <laughs> oh, and I would totally complain about people moving to this neighborhood. <laughs> I'd be so awesome. I'd be like fighting development, and yeah. So, uh, a few things I picked out. Uh, some of my personal favorites from the book that I'm gonna read for you. Uh, number 41. Indie music. If you want to understand white people, you need to understand indie music. As mentioned before, white people hate anything that's mainstream and are desperate to find things that are more genuine, unique, and reflective of their experiences. Fortunately, they have independent music. A white person's iPod, formerly CD collection, is not merely an assemblage of music they enjoy. It's what defines them as a person. They're always on the lookout for the latest hot band that no one's heard of, so that one day they can hit it just right and be into a band before it's featured in an Apple commercial. To a white person, being a fan of a band before it gets popular is one of the most important things they can do with their lives. They can hold it over their friends forever. Indie music also produces a lot of concerts at which white people can meet other white people. Concerts are useful because if white people are attending the same concert, it means they both like the artist and can easily strike up a conversation that will flow from band at the show to other bands they like, to where they went to college, to where they can get the best vegan food in town, to an, to an agreement to meet at said restaurant for an awkward date. It's worth noting that white people are expected to stay current with music and go to concerts well into their 40s. Unlike at dance or hip-hop clubs, there are a few stigmas attached to being the old guy at the club. <laughs> Warning, indie music is perhaps the most dangerous subject you can discuss with white people. One false move and you'll lose their respect and admiration forever. Here are some general rules. Bands that have had their songs in an Apple ad are still marginally acceptable. Bands that have had their songs in ads for other companies are not acceptable. If you mention a band you like, and the other person has heard of it, you lose. <laughs> they own you. It's essential that you like the most obscure music possible. Remember, popular artists can turn unpopular in a heartbeat. Ryan Adams, Bright Eyes, The Strokes. So it'd be best to stick with the following statements. I love Arcade Fire. I still think the Montreal scene's the best in the world. I would die without stereo gum. And Joanna Newsom is maybe the most original artist today. I get, the one thing I can hold over everybody was uh, my roommate for a while when I was, I used to live in Montreal, was the lead singer of Arcade Fire. So I was going to their shows before they got big, and yeah, I heard all the oohs and ahs. Yeah, winner. <laughs> T 
total victory. Uh, I hold on to that one forever. Uh, this one I've definitely seen throughout Sydney. Uh, number 53, dogs. A lot of cultures love dogs, be they for entertainment, labor, or food. But white people love dogs on an entirely different level. It should be understood that in white culture, dogs are considered training for having children. All white couples must get a dog before having kids. This will prepare them for the responsibility by having another creature to feed, love, and toilet train. Because of this, white people generally assume that their dog is the favorite child, unless otherwise stated. When actual children are born, the dog is not displaced, but rather remains as the most important member of the household. This is because of the fact that white children will eventually hate their parents, but dogs will love anyone who feeds them. <laughs> white people generally believe dogs have human emotions and are capable of loving certain TV shows, films, and music. Buster just loves watching Six Feet Under, even though most dogs would enjoy watching Hitler if they got attention every time he was on TV. <laughs> they also believe their dogs share similar tastes in food. Oh, little Ben Queller likes organic food the best forgetting the fact that dogs enjoy eating their own feces, as well as pretty much anything that falls on the floor. When searching for homes, many white people require large yards so their dog can run around. If you work in real estate, this can be exploited for large markups when selling to white people. It's also a proven fact that dogs are often used by white people to attract members of the opposite sex. Bringing a puppy or a dog to a local dog park will encourage interaction and conversation, even more so than a Mac laptop. If white people talk about their dogs, it's essential that you reassure them that their dogs are absolutely special and unique. Furiously agree that treating dogs like children is the only way to care for a pet. Under no circumstances should you ever say anything that's, that is derogatory towards dogs, critical of spoiling dogs, or implies that dogs are not full members of society who deserve the same rights as humans. Doing any of these three things will completely destroy your relationship with white people. Dogs are not people. Um, this is... In Los Angeles, it's out of control, and people get angry that they can't bring their dogs into restaurants. I always want to say, can we cook it? <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a personal favorite of mine. So in Toronto, I grew up in Chinatown. And so this, was, this is something that I do an awful lot, and uh, I'm not really working to change it. Number 71, being the only white person around. This concept ties heavily into number seven, diversity, and number 19, international travel. But it's important that you fully understand how white people view authenticity and experience. In most situations, white people are very comforted by seeing their own kind. However, when they're eating at a new ethnic restaurant or traveling to a foreign nation, nothing spoils their fun more than seeing another white person. <laughs> Many white people will look into the window of an ethnic restaurant to see if there are other white people inside. It is determined to be an acceptable restaurant if the white people in there are accompanied by ethnic friends. But if there's a table occupied entirely by white people, it is deemed unacceptable. <laughs> the arrival of the other white people at either restaurants or vacation spots instantly means that lines will grow, authenticity will be caught lost, and the euphoria of being a cultural pioneer will be over. Being aware of this can be extremely valuable in your efforts to gain the trust of white friends and coworkers. If you take a white person to an ethnic restaurant and another white person or group of white people shows up, you can lose all respect and trust that you've worked so hard to acquire. Do your best to find a table with a divider and ask the waiter to put future white people out of sight. <laughs> Note, this does not apply to nightclubs. <laughs> that one's very specific to America. Um, some of these, yeah, ah, that one's not going to fit quite so well. Um, also, if you have the book, I also have a very funny thing in here that I think is applicable to here, is the gentrification timeline. And I noticed an organic bakery in here, so we're doing all right. Uh, Newtown is right about here. The Whole Foods is over here. So uh, it's coming. Um, now, this one's one of my favorites that I have to explain to some people, uh, non-white people, often. T-shirts. Many people in cultures view T-shirts as simple pieces of apparel that can be acquired cheaply and worn in casual situations. For white people, it's never that easy. The t-shirt is one of the most complex and expressive items in their entire wardrobe. Your choice of casual wear says a lot about you. There are stringent rules and hierarchies associated with t-shirts that you must know before venturing into any white-dominated social situation. T-shirts fall into three categories, vintage, new, and unacceptable, <laughs> with the latter, the latter category compromising the bulk of the world's supply. Within each category lies another more precise subset of rules and rankings. This is complicated, make no mistake. 
The most prized t-shirt category is vintage. As shown earlier, white people need authenticity like they need oxygen. And the ownership of an original vintage t-shirt from the 70s or 80s is a very powerful social status symbol. The ideal shirt will have a funny logo, a year attached to it, and it will be as thin as rice paper. In the event that two white people have shirts that meet these criteria, the superior ranking is giving to the person who paid the least for the shirt. <laughs> Acquiring a shirt at a vintage clothing store is seen as less respectable than sorting through racks at Goodwill. The second category of t-shirt is new, and there are really only two options. The first is American Apparel, a company that constantly reminds you it's based in downtown Los Angeles. It's considered an acceptable white company since it produces things that are very simple, but also very expensive. The second acceptable new shirt is Threadless. This Chicago-based t -shirt, this Chicago -based company produces artistic and funny t-shirts that are acceptable for concerts, trips to Whole Foods, and 80s night. White people like these shirts so much because they're designed by white people for white people. Sort of like a white fubu. <laughs> Finally, and perhaps most important to be aware of, is the unacceptable category of t-shirt. There are a few simple rules to follow in order to avoid wearing the wrong one. First, if it's made of a stiff, thick cotton, throw it in the garbage immediately. White people t-shirts must be made of the softest, finest organic cotton. This is law. Unless it's vintage, the shirt cannot be made in a foreign country, unless you can certify its labor conditions. The shirt cannot contain a current sports logo. Shirts with sports logos are acceptable, but they must contain a logo that hasn't been used for 15 years. Last, not least, it cannot be baggy. Your t-shirt must be tight-fitting for both style and mating purposes. It is also to imper imperative to understand that faux vintage shirts, getting lucky in Kentucky, are completely unacceptable. They are beloved by the wrong kind of white people and must be avoided at all costs. <laughs> this information is best applied when you're planning on attending a social gathering. Your t-shirt says a lot about you, and if it's the right kind of shirt, it'll set white people at ease. Also, asking a white person, where'd you get that shirt? will allow them to tell you a detailed story of how they acquired it. This will enable them to assert the reason their shirt has a higher ranking than yours. I get into these fights all the time. I totally win. I have a 1989 Quebec Special Olympics shirt. G good luck beating that one. Freaking Special Olympics. It's, it's pretty real. Uh, this one is essential, considering we're at a writer's festival. Uh, number 138, books. The role of books in white culture is perhaps as important as organic food, essential for survival. However, understand that this is not about literacy or reading, but about the physical object of a book. Try this out as an experiment. Show a white person a photo of a living room that features an entire wall of floor-to-ceiling bookshelves. They are guaranteed to respond by saying how much they would love that in their own home, and they're planning on having a living room just like that in the future. This is because white people need to show off the books that they have just read. Just as hunters will mount the heads of their kills, white people need to let people know that they've made their way through hundreds or even thousands of books. After all, what's the point of reading a book if people don't know you've read it? It's like a tree falling in the forest. As much as white people do not want you rifling through their medicine cabinet, they are desperate for you to examine their bookshelves. When scanning through the rows of books, the best things you can say are, you made it through infinite jest? Wow. Or, I didn't know you loved Joyce so much. If your intentions are to grow your friendship either romantically or platonically, there's no better technique than to ask to borrow one of the books. This is because lending out books is the only practical reason for white people to hold on to their entire collection. So by asking to borrow a copy, you're justifying their decision to save the book, allowing them to both introduce you to a new author and assert their status as a well-read individual. It is the perfect move. But there are times when your visit to a white person's house is not long enough for a full inspection of their bookshelves. How then can you gauge their taste? Simple. Look at the coffee table. You see, white people like to purchase very expensive, very large books that they can put on their coffee table for other people to see and then use to make value judgments. If the coffee table book is about art, then the white person wants you to ask them about their trip to the Tate Modern. If it's about photography, they want you to ask them about their new camera. If it's about football or bikinis, you should politely ask to leave. <laughs> so now that you know that white people like books, you might assume that a book is the perfect gift. Not so fast. There are few possible outcomes from giving book, and few of them end well. If you get a white person a book they already have, the situation will be uncomfortable. If you get them a book they do not want, you'll be forever viewed as someone with poor taste in literature. In the event that you get them a book that they want to read and do not have, they're forced to recognize that they have not read it, which instantly paints you as a threat. <laughs> there is no way to win when you give a book to a white person. <laughs> it's, so, it's so hard, you know what I mean? It's like so much work. So hard being white. All right, the last one I want to read, um, 
particularly applicable to uh, Australia, rock climbing. For the record, I fucking hate this sport. <laughs> or activity, I don't know what you even call it. Number 150, rock climbing. For much of human history, when a human being saw a mountain in front of them, their reaction was, damn, I wish this mountain wasn't here. Why can't someone just blow a hole through this? One day, after many roads and tunnels had been constructed, a white person thought to himself, you know what? I'm going to climb this, look around, and then climb back down. The view from the top will be worth risking my life. And rock climbing was born. Though the entire activity can be made pointless with the introduction of an extremely long ladder, <laughs> white people love rock climbing almost more than they love camping. This is because the activity affords them the opportunity to be outside, use a carabiner for something other than their keys, and enabling them to purchase a whole new set of expensive, activity-specific clothing and accessories. <laughs> the appeal of the sport has grown in recent years as cities and college campuses have opened indoor rock climbing facilities. Now urban white people can experience all the thrill of climbing up something, looking around, and then climbing back down without having to take a long drive. <laughs> there is no gold at the top of the mountain, no secret lair, not even a snack bar. The only reward is self-satisfaction and the opportunity to say, dude, Crazy weekend. We did the summit of, insert mountain. It was intense. Me and a few buddies are planning a trip to Peru to climb. Exploiting a white person who's into rock climbing is not very difficult. Simply praise them for their tremendous skill and drop a hint that you'd be willing to house sit the next time they go climbing. Note, house sitting is the activity of living in a white person's house when they're away. It's a good opportunity to eat their few food and make a few extra dollars. But how can you tell if a white person's into rock climbing? It's easy. Talk to them for 10 minutes. White people who like rock climbing love to tell people about how they go climbing on the weekend and would love nothing more than for you to join them or at least enroll in a rock climbing class. Do not accept. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you all so much for coming out. <laughs>